Hello and welcome. It's your friendly neighborhood narrator, Sue, here. Get cozy as I share with you. Sometimes terrifying, sometimes heartwarming, but always thought provoking encounters of Bigfoot, Dogman, and the straight up paranormal. I post new videos every day, so be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And with that, let's get right into it. Hello, my name is Jared, and I saw something unforgettable while on my boat in 1995. It was a beautiful summer day in Arkansas. I was feeling pretty content just drifting along in my rowboat, enjoying the tranquility. I had been fishing for a few hours, not catching much of anything, and I was getting a little bored. I was about to pack up and head home, when I looked toward the shore and saw something that gave me PTSD. There was a group of non-human primates traveling through the trees. There were about six of them, and they were all taller than any person I knew. They were moving very quickly and seemed to follow a designated trail. I was so stunned that I just watched them in my boat. They didn't seem to notice me, and they just kept going. After a few minutes, they were out of sight. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. I had always been fascinated by the theory that Sasquatch roam our forest, but seeing one is an entirely different thing. I was so excited that I almost dropped my fishing rod. I sat there for a few minutes trying to process what happened. I couldn't believe I had become one of the few who see these things in the flesh. The experience only lasted a few moments, but I still felt like I had acquired a rare gem. I decided to continue along the shoreline to see if I could get another glimpse at the magnificent animals, for I felt there was a safe distance between us. I wanted to see where they were going, but couldn't find them. I convinced a buddy to return there with me the following day, since I had a friend with me. I felt confident enough to search for the creatures on land. We found a trail near where I saw them, leading us into the woods. We followed it for about a mile. We eventually arrived at a clearing where things started to feel off. Not long after, we spotted the odd-looking tree structure around a hundred yards further. The treehouse was made of branches and leaves, and had to have been as high as 20 feet. My buddy and I stood there for a long time, observing the mysterious fort and wondering if we should get closer. Immediately, I knew that the elusive creatures constructed that thing. I don't know how I knew that, but I did. I remember feeling such a peculiar mix of emotions. It almost felt like I'd entered a drug-induced state, even though I hadn't. The treehouse was empty. There was no one inside. Before I knew it, my friend approached the structure and peered inside. My heart nearly stopped when I saw him place his cheek against the wood and stare through a sliver of space. I thought he had made the worst mistake of his life. I was ready to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. Soon, he asked me to come check things out, assuring me it was empty but I was too afraid. He then walked over to me and told me there appeared to be a bed made of leaves, straw, and other vegetation. He said there were a few other objects in there, but he couldn't tell what they were because it was too dark inside. I then suggested we get going, for I didn't want to get caught in the woods after dark, and I didn't want whatever had made that structure to find us. Fortunately, we made it out of the woods unharmed. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was following us until we returned to our vehicle. I'm curious about what the Sasquatch think of humans. There's, of course, no possibility they aren't aware we exist. I wonder if they think of us as prey or something to avoid altogether. I must admit that the mysterious nature of the species can sometimes feel overwhelming. There's not much I wouldn't give in order to get to the bottom of their origin, 
and I know I'm far from the only one with that desire. On to the next one. My best friend and I went camping with my family in 1995, and we did something so incredibly stupid that it has changed our lives forever, and we had an experience we will never forget because of it. My parents had a very large and state-of-the-art for the time camper van that they had just bought and they wanted to take it into the woods to camp for one of our vacations that year. I was 11 years old and didn't want to go without my best friend, Gina. Gina lived next door and our moms had been pregnant with us at the same time and we were also best friends. Of course, our parents were okay with her coming with us and off we went for our end of summer vacation in the woods. There was an area near our home, about an hour's drive away, where you could bring your camper into the woods and park it for your stay. There was also a place for people who wanted to camp out the old-fashioned way, in tents and stuff, but the areas were just a little bit separate from one another. While we had our own spot where the van was parked, where we could barbecue and build our own fire, there were other people around. And it wasn't like we were all alone out there in the deep, dark woods. It was a national park. And I don't want to say the name of it. And somewhere we had gone so many times before. We knew we would have fun. And this was Gina's first time ever camping, which made me even more excited about the whole thing. I was like a kid on the night before Christmas. And Gina was really excited, too. We made it to the park and found our spot. We went to work making food and building a campfire. Though the camper was very modern and a little fancy, it wasn't brand new. While my parents went to work outside of the van, me and Gina hung out inside and started planning all the things we wanted to do while we were there. We were hungry and waiting for my parents to get dinner ready. We were looking through the cabinets for something to snack on to hold us over when we found a Ouija board. We both loved horror movies and had been watching them for years at that point and thought we hadn't ever seen or handled one in real life. We had seen the board in movies and thought we knew what it was and what it did. Needless to say, we had no idea and I wish we hadn't ever found that board. But we did find it and we were excited about it. My parents were religious, but they weren't fanatics or anything. However, I knew my mother would blow a gasket if she knew there had been a Ouija board in the van. When they bought it, and not only that, but that me and my friend planned on using it. We hid the board and decided we would wait until we were able to go into the woods and do something by ourselves to use it. So my parents didn't see it. If we had to, we figured we would just leave it there in the woods and forget about it. We were dying to try it, though, and we were excited by the alleged dangers using it brought with it. Finally, dinner was ready, and we went outside to hang out with my parents. We knew there was a place to go swimming, and so we asked my parents if we could go there the next day. They said they had wanted to do some hiking to the other side of the park, but that if we promised to stay together and if we agreed to take a map that we could go swimming without them the following morning. After all, it stood to reason that we wouldn't be alone and even that there would be other kids there too because the place looked very busy when we pulled in and paid for some park extras at the welcome station. It was the 90s and things were very different back then than they are nowadays. The first night there was really fun, and my parents even joined in when we told spooky and creepy stories by the campfire. The van slept four people, which was perfect, because me and Gina always shared a bed at sleepovers anyway. We stayed in the back of the van, and my parents pulled their bed out of the wall in the front of it, right behind the driver and passenger seat. The next morning, we woke up bright and early, and my dad already had breakfast almost done. 
Gina and I put on our swimsuit. We put our clothes on over them, and then we packed our backpacks with snacks, drinks, and other things we wanted to bring swimming with us. I put the Ouija board and planchette in my bag, and we left after a very long and boring lecture from my parents about staying together in the woods, the areas where we could get help, reading and following the map, and what we would call today stranger danger. We hiked through the woods, and though we passed maybe one or two elderly couples, we didn't see as many people as we expected along the way. We didn't think anything of that and kept going. Finally, we made it to the swimming spot, but we were surprised that there were only about 10 other people there and no kids. There were no little kids and no kids our age. There were no older teenagers either. In fact, we noticed there were only old people, which to our 11-year-old selves consisted of anyone over the age of 30. We thought it was weird, but it didn't concern us or anything. We knew we had to be back to the van for dinner, which was going to be at 7 o'clock, and we brought our lunches with us. We swam and played for a while, and after we ate our lunch and a few hours had passed, we decided to try out the Ouija board. I didn't notice it at the time, but looking back on it, it's like as soon as we made that decision for one reason or another, every single person vacated the swimming area and Gina and I were all by ourselves. It was a bright and sunny day, despite it almost being fall, and we dried off fairly quickly in the sun. We remembered seeing people use one of the boards in a movie we had seen a few times, and we just decided to do it like we remembered. We went to one of the tables in the little picnic and park area near where we had just gone swimming and placed our hands on the planchette. We giggled nervously and asked if anyone was there. In an instant, the planchette moved to yes. We both had agreed beforehand that no matter what, we weren't going to move it and we trusted each other, so we were both shocked with how easy it had been to get an answer. Gina asked who was there with us, and the word demon was spelled back to us. We both took our hands off the board immediately, because despite it being broad daylight and the fact that we were in a safe place, it scared us. We were little kids, and it scared us enough that we quit right there on the spot, both of us pretending that we didn't want to stop except to please the other one, and we both promised one another we would try again later on. We didn't say goodbye or thank the board or anything. We simply put it back in my book bag and went on with our day. We had originally decided to swim some more, but the day turned overcast rather quickly, and we both had the distinct feeling that we were being watched, because there was no one else around us anymore. It was a scary feeling, and we both knew that whatever was watching us had to have been doing so from somewhere in the woods. We played a few games of cards, but eventually, the feeling became too much, and we decided to go back to our camp earlier than we were going to at first. We made our way through the woods, but it seemed like all at once, everything was different. We didn't see any of the signs we had noticed coming in, and couldn't find where we were on the map my parents had given us. We both knew how to read maps fairly well, and yet, somehow, we got lost anyway. We weren't too concerned at first, because we figured out we would eventually come across someone who would be able to help us, but after what seemed like forever, but was really about an hour of walking and not seeing anyone, we became not only very worried, but we were also pretty exhausted as well. We sat on a large tree stump waiting for someone to walk by, but no one did, and to take our minds off what was going on, we once again decided to pull the Ouija board out. We placed it on the ground and knelt in front of it. After saying hello, we once again asked who was there, and we got the response, death. That was it, and we were so frazzled by that point 
that, I took the board and tossed it into the woods, along with the planchette. Gina and I knew it would be dark soon, and we were definitely not equipped to be out there in the middle of the wilderness, alone at nighttime. We just kept right on walking, in the direction of where we believed our camp was, hoping we would just run into it somehow, eventually. It was dark out, and we were still lost. We were both crying by that time and still hadn't seen a single sign or another living soul the whole time. It was eerie because we knew that we should have seen several or both of those things. Finally, we stopped to rest again, and that's when an old man seemed to come out of nowhere and asked us if we were lost. We were crying but so thankful to see him, we both jumped and told him that yes, we were lost and we needed help. He smiled, but when he did, it was terrifying. His smile didn't reach his eyes, and his teeth were broken and stained by what looked like tobacco. We were good kids and didn't want to be rude, so we suppressed our initial fear and gut instinct and told the man where we needed to go. He was really thin and looked like your average old man. He was a bit hunched in the back, had very thin white hair, and his skin was very pale and full of liver spots. He told us he knew right where that was, where we told him our camper was, and he told us to follow him. He whistled a tune as he walked, and it was creepy. I don't know how else to describe it. The man had a flashlight he handed to me, and though he was leading the way and the forest was pitch black, he didn't seem to need one. He was also dressed very oddly for where we were because he was wearing what looked like a tailor-made three-piece suit and very shiny shoes. His cane looked like a big snake and was perfectly carved by hand. Gina and I just looked at each other, and after 15 minutes of walking, we realized we didn't know this old man, and we could be putting ourselves in even more harm's way than we were before we met him. He could be a psycho for all we knew. We didn't say anything, though in case he was helping us, we didn't want to be rude to him. We were still crying and we were both extremely scared. Eventually, he turned to us and I will never forget the look on his face. It was evil and his whole appearance had somehow been transformed. He wasn't a kindly old man anymore, but a grotesque thing that neither me nor Gina knew how to classify. The old man was still there. We could still see him, but we also knew there was something else underneath. We both screamed. He told us to shut up and knew both of our names despite us knowing for sure we hadn't given it to him. He told us to stay put, and we did, as we were told and sat on a log there in the middle of the forest. There still hadn't been anyone around, and within a minute, the old man returned. He looked even more demonic at this point, and it was almost like the facade of the old man was slowly fading away, and the evil underneath was seeping through more and more. He pulled the Ouija board out from behind his back and said we had been bad girls for throwing it the way we had. He pointed to me. You, he said and his voice was almost a growl at this point. Come here. I didn't move and started screaming. His eyes were flames in his head, and they weren't kind and bright blue anymore. By that time, Gina was screaming with me, and he told us both to be quiet. Suddenly, he was standing straight up, and had to have been about nine feet tall. His body contorted and turned into a half-man Half goat looking thing as we looked on in terror. Use the board, he demanded. We both shook our heads, no, and started screaming again. Then, coming from out of the darkness, I heard my father's voice calling mine and Gina's names. I must have passed out, and I guess Gina did too. I woke up lying next to Gina on our bed in the camper. I immediately called for my dad, and Gina grabbed my hand. We were both too weak to do anything other than lay there. We were also both absolutely terrified of what we had been through. 
My dad came running into the van while my mom spoke to the park rangers outside. I looked up at my dad and he smiled and told me it would be okay. However, standing behind him, but too blurry almost for me to be able to see, was the old man. He wasn't in the old man form, but the top of his body was that of a very physical fit god, and the bottom half of a goat. He still held his snake cane, but then he pointed it at me and Gina and started to laugh the most evil laugh I've ever heard. I started crying and sobbing, and Gina must have seen him too, because she was also shaking like crazy and sobbing. My dad tried to comfort us, but the devil stood behind him the whole time mocking us. We went back to sleep and didn't wake up until breakfast the next morning. My parents looked at us, concerned, but asked us anyway what happened the day before. We told them everything, except for the part where we played with the Ouija board and the part where the old man transformed into a devil. We knew they wouldn't believe us anyway. They told us the rangers said no one fitting that description as far as they knew had been in the parks at the time. They also asked us why we had ignored all the people we passed along the way while we were lost, who had asked us if we were okay and offered to help us. That really confused us because we hadn't seen another living soul the whole time we were wandering around out there. Gina and I just looked at each other, and my parents must have seen how it was upsetting us. Though they couldn't have possibly guessed how much or why, and thankfully they dropped the subject. We weren't allowed to go off on our own anymore for the rest of the trip, but that was okay with us, because we really didn't want to. We never saw that Ouija board again, but that old man and devil bee haunted our dreams and even visited us sometimes while we were wide awake, usually in the middle of the night and when we were together many times after that. Finally, when we were 16, we came across some information that said if we got a Ouija board and properly closed it by saying goodbye, it would be the end of the whole ordeal. We did it, and it was but I still wonder what it was we were really dealing with that day and if it or he is ever going to come back for us. I know it's a lot and somewhat hard to believe, but I implore you, please don't ever mess with something like a Ouija board or other divining tools unless you know what you're doing. As an adult, I've searched for answers and come to the conclusion based on my research, that we hadn't encountered a devil that day, but some sort of forest demon that feeds off fear, especially the fear of children. I think we woke whatever it was up with the board, and though I haven't gone back there since then to see for sure, I think it's probably still roaming around out there, preying on people. It makes sense, because that particular national park is known for bizarre events, and people mysteriously dying and disappearing, and while that's always been the case with the place in particular, but also for places like it all over the world. There seemed to have been a huge uptick in cases since the mid-90s when me and Gina used the board. We must have opened a portal or something. I'm going back there next summer, and I'm going to bring my own Ouija board now that I know how to use it and see if I can somehow close whatever portal or vortex we opened. While I know we aren't responsible for most of what happens there, I can't help but feel a little guilty, because I do believe we played a role at least in some part of it. Thank you for letting me share this. Are you feeling cozy? I post new videos every single day. So, if you subscribe and hit that notification bell, you'll be notified whenever those videos go live. Okay, on to the next one. I was around 13 years old, and my best friend was 12. We had been badgering our parents for walkie-talkies for a couple of years because we used to play in the woods so often. Much to our delight, my friend's father was cleaning out their attic and found a set left by the previous owners of the house. He cleaned them up, got us new batteries, and we were on our way. There were very few houses in our area at the time, 
and plenty of wooded areas to play. We headed down to where a new road was being cut. The crews had basically plowed a rough dirt road almost a half a mile into the dense forest off our road. We got almost to the end when we headed back into the woods. We started heading toward the direction of an old quarry that had been abandoned for many years. We had gone in about 100 yards when we agreed to start walking in opposite directions, but parallel to the road, so we could test the range of the walkie-talkie. We were alternating our responses for about 40 to 50 yards when my friend stopped responding. I could still see him in the breaks of the foliage, so after several attempts to reach him via the walkie-talkie, I just called out to him. He came back across the radio and told me not to shout or move. I asked him what was happening and he told me to be very still because he saw something behind a large tree that had fallen about another 40 yards further in. It had just stormed about a week earlier and many trees in the woods had fallen. This particular tree had its roots exposed but was still suspended on the leaf end about three to five feet above the ground due to a tangle of vine. He said that he could feel the something watching him, and he was scared to move. I told him that I didn't see anything, and I would walk towards him. He warned me again not to move, and said that the thing was shifting its weight and started moving towards my end of the tree. I stood there looking at the root disc and suddenly saw would appear to be a dark face and broad shoulders. I too could feel this thing watching me. The creature, if you will, moved back and forth as if studying my friend and me. The height was undiscernible, but had to be above six feet tall. It was hard to see the legs, but those also appeared to be dark in color. After about five minutes of this thing alternating vantage points, I had enough and was ready to make a dash for the road. My friend reluctantly agreed to move toward the spot while keeping an eye on the fallen tree. We finally met up and began to back up. We had only gotten a few yards when we saw the creature rise up and put its hand on the trunk by the root disc. My friend and I screamed at full volume and started to run for the road. We turned only once after hearing a loud crack of wood possibly a branch or something underfoot, to see this creature running almost noiselessly in the opposite direction. It again was very difficult to see, but appeared to be completely black, powerfully built, and running on two legs. We ran all the way back home, said we would keep this incident between us. A few days later, my friend's father said he had read an article in the Yuga Times Leader, a local paper, dating a woman in a nearby town had seen a Sasquatch. We asked what a Sasquatch was, and his dad laughed, saying it was a cross between an ape and a man, and it wasn't real. We read the article, and it sounded exactly like what we had seen. My friend's older brother said that he had heard something following him along the Chagrin River as he was going to a friend's house a week before, and joked that it might have been the same thing as what was reported in the newspaper article. I never spoke of this incident until I was in my adulthood and had moved out of the area. I still haven't gotten over that sensation and think about it every time I take a walk in the woods. There were very few sounds of insects or birds except for distant sounds. Slight sharp smells to the air around us as if a skunk had been in the area the night before. Just me and my friend had walked about a mile before entering the wood. Clear day, extremely humid and warm. It was some time in the early afternoon. Heavy leaf canopy, tall trees, and many hanging vines. There was a little bit of new growth, about two feet tall, popping up in patches. The quarry was nearby, but out of sight due to the heavy foliage and general distance. No houses except the one at the foot of the street bordering Dines Road. Apparently, there were quite a few stories emerging from the Wayne Forest around the same time. On to the next one. In Ironton, in Lawrence County, in Ohio, 
I was at home when my brother called to say that he had run out of gas and needed me to walk the gas can down to his location, which was about three blocks away. Upon arriving at the location, he was looking in the direction of the creek bed next to his parked car. He claimed he could hear something in the weeds moving around and complained of a nasty smell coming from the area. When I arrived, I immediately noticed the smell he was talking about, and at some time, I could hear whatever it was moving around in the weed. All of a sudden, my brother grabbed my hand because he saw the creature and said, let's get out of here. As we proceeded back towards our house, I turned around and I could see a six to seven foot tall, upright walking animal covered with very thick hair approaching us at a very rapid pace. I noticed its shoulders were extremely wide and when it walked, it made strides that were very non-human-like in proportion. We ran back to our house, and it followed us, though never catching up to us. When we made it back to our driveway, a car was coming in the other direction. Then my brother and I turned around to catch another look at the creature as it was running into the weed on the north side of the road. My brother and I decided not to stick around, and we quickly made our way up our driveway into the safety of our house. After this encounter, we came to a logical conclusion that what we were fortunate enough to see was something that fit the description of the so-called animal Bigfoot. There is no way it could have been a bear because bears can't run on two legs. I have no idea what else it could have possibly been. It was 1.30 a.m. The weather was hot and dry. It is a hilly forested area with abandoned rail tracks in the vicinity of Little Storm Creek. On to the next one. In Hawking County, Ohio, Ron, his father, son, and a family friend were hunting. Ron was bow hunting for deer. His father and a friend were squirrel hunting with shotgun. Ron's brother was to go, but could not make it, so Ron took his son Scott with him. Ron set off down a gas line toward SR-56. We were to meet at lunch. Scott went with grandfather and a family friend. About a half a mile in, they passed an old deserted cabin. After passing it, Scott smelled something putrid, like rotting meat, and asked Bob, their family friend, what that smell was. Bob shrugged and said, rotting vegetation. Bob and Scott walked many ridges and hollows, then re-entered the same gas line. At this point, Scott saw a barefoot print approximately 11 to 12 inches long. He pointed it out to Bob, saying someone has been running around barefoot. Bob just looked at it and said, yep. Nothing Scott was seeing or smelling was registering until later. Scott had smelled the same smell several times during the morning. Ron and his dad Bernard, son Scott, and family friend Bob met back at the cars at lunch. Scott went to the edge of the clearing to yearning and once again smelled the same smell. He said later a strange feeling like he was being watched came over him, but he shrugged it off. For the afternoon hunting, they entered the gas line from the other end of SR-56. Ron and Scott went together, this time so that Scott could observe bow hunting to see if he would be interested in doing it later on. Bernard and Bob took off with shotguns to squirrel hunt. After a small climb, we got to the area that looked promising for deer. Scott sat down about five yards behind Ron. They both started hearing movement behind them toward the ridge. Scott turned toward where he thought the sound was coming from. The sound was like heavy movement in the brush and small limbs breaking. Most of the sound seemed to slowly circle its way around us to the left, with a little noise still behind us after several minutes. Ron was looking intently into one area, but it was obscured from Scott's direct sight by brush, although he could see some movement at times. Ron held his hand, palm back, telling Scott to stay put. At this point, he descended a hill they were hunting on by about 15 yards. Ron stood there for about five minutes, then turned and walked back to Scott and said, let go. Scott told him he saw something moving, and Ron asked where, and Scott pointed. Ron asked Scott what color it was, and he said black. Ron once again said, let go. We got to the top of the ridge and met up with Bernard and Bob. Still not making any connection, 
Bernard had a box and some shells and had Scott practiced shooting, then they headed for the cars. About 20 yards down, Scott smelled that same smell. Everyone did, except Ron, who has a bad nose. We left in separate cars and headed home. Bernard and Bob in one, Scott and Ron in the other. Scott fell asleep on the way home. About 45 minutes from home, Scott woke up and jokingly asked Ron if he saw Bigfoot today. Ron turned and looked Scott in the eyes and said yes. He then proceeded to tell him what he had seen. In the afternoon, when Scott and Ron were together and they heard the sound, Ron saw movement. That is when Ron told Scott to stay put. He moved down about 15 yards for a closer look. He said the first few times something moved out from behind a tree, but only about four to five inches. The next time it stepped out further, exposing half of its body with a large arm hanging down to its knees. He described it as at least seven feet tall, huge torso, big muscular arms down to its knees, and head set on shoulders with no neck and reddish eyes. Ron said the effect on him was like someone lit a match at his feet and the heat traveled all the way to the top of his head. Ron said he wasn't sure how he would have reacted had he not had got to be concerned about getting out of there. He was intent on getting out of there when Bob and Bernard met up with them. On to the next one. I was about 15 and my family was on vacation on its way to Alabama, said Bill. Myself and two brothers were asleep in the back seat when we were awakened by my mother's scream. My dad, now 91, and mom, 86, have told this story many times. It goes like this. While driving, this tall, hairy man-like thing walked out onto the highway. My dad hit his brights and slammed on the brakes and just missed the thing as it turned and my dad swerved to miss it. It raised one arm and the long hair on the arm brushed over the windshield on my mom's side of the car. We stopped and it was gone. After my mom calmed down, we were on our way. I did not see it, but can say that my dad and mom are not prone to make up tales. I do believe that story they tell to this day. In January, at about 2.30 a.m., two more motorists saw an eight-foot-tall, hairy, man-like creature while driving about 20 miles outside of Mayfield. According to the witness, the thing had long, shiny, dark hair covering its entire body. Despite this fact, they both noticed that it had very distinctive or pronounced muscle definition on its arms and legs. The face was human-like, they said, especially the eyes. It turned its head and watched them as their vehicle passed only two or three feet away. Both witnesses felt sure that the entity they saw was man-like and not a bear or any other conventional animal. Its face was what startled me the most, the witness later stated because it had human-like features, especially the eyes, not like any animal's eyes I'd ever seen before. Its eyes followed us as we passed. Nighttime yowler activity was reported from the Diamond Resort Mammoth Cave State Park in Cave City in the summer. Nearly four years later, a deer hunter saw something he would never forget near Cave City, Kentucky. At around 4 a.m. on the morning of January, he was getting ready to come down from his deer stand, looking everything over to make sure he had gathered all his deer hunting equipment, when he heard an ungodly high-pitched scream come from the nearby woods. Then I smelled this awful smell. The witness, a man named Chris, later stated, like something was dead. It was then that I caught sight of this thing out of the corner of my eye. The thing was a man-like, hair-covered giant that stood eight feet tall. Chris remained in a stand, which was situated 15 feet above the ground in a wooded area of Lazy Acres Estate, and watched the creature. After the thing screamed, he said, everything became extremely quiet. The rotten stench that filled the air was so strong that he felt nauseous. The dark-colored, hairy creature was walking from left to right in front of his stand. It walked upright like a man, 
swinging its arms much more dramatically than a human would, its hand hang down to around knee level. It had broad shoulders and a big bulky body. Due to the minimal lighting conditions, the witness couldn't make out any facial details, nor could he approximate the hair length. The creature paused a moment directly in front of its location, then proceeded to walk quietly 40 to 50 yards away from his tree stand. The witness later claimed that he has heard similar screams five or six times over the past two years while hunting on this private property located near Mammoth Cave. Four months later in May, another Barron County hunter got more than he bargained for when he saw something that he could not identify approaching his hunting area. I'd went up to where I deer hunt, he said, and was checking the area to look for any deer movement, like trails or rubs, and I noticed that several trees were moved into, like huts or shelters, and I smelled an awful smell. Then I heard something walking, so I laid down and crawled under some brush. The smell got worse, and then I saw this tall animal, almost like a gorilla. I laid as still as possible. I brought my gun just in case I ran into a bobcat, but I was so scared that I didn't move. After around 10 minutes, it walked off. I waited around three more minutes and went to get up and the scream that sounded like the gates of hell had opened. I took the safety off my gun and slowly walked to my car, then left the area as fast as I could. He later described the animal as about eight feet tall with a slightly slumped over posture, arms that reached to knee level and covered with hair the color of tree bark. At around midnight on July, a couple intending to take a late night stroll near a wooded pond in Cave City had their evening cut unexpectedly short. Amber and Chris Page were driving near Mammoth Cave and decided to take a moonlight stroll around a pond. As we pulled up, the light hit something red and it moved like a pair of eyes. Chris later stated, We thought nothing about it. We got out of the car and heard this grunt. The grunt was followed by the sound of heavy footsteps running in their direction. Unnerved, the two lovers dashed back into their car and beat a hasty retreat. Barron County once voted the number one place to live in rural America by Progressive Farmers Magazine, was founded in 1798 and has a population of just over 43,000 people. Barron County is nearly 500 square miles of steep, heavily forested hills, valleys, streams, and caves. The perfect habitat for a mysterious unknown hominid, such as was allegedly seen in October by a man riding with his grandfather deep into the forest to cut wood for the coming winter. The two were driving down an old dirt road behind his home when the witness saw a six to seven foot tall creature standing on the right side of the road, approximately 75 yards in front of them, and looking directly at the truck. Suddenly, it turned and ran across the road, disappearing into the dense wood. It ran hunched over, the witness stated, and was covered in long, dark, shaggy hair. Its arms hung down by its sides as he ran. He told one local investigator, who, with a couple of friends, staked out the location overnight with the same less than spectacular result that usually comes from such investigation. On to the next one. The elusive creature showed up in Bath County in June. On that day, as two field workers who wish to remain anonymous were coming in from the field after a long day of setting tobacco in Sharpburg, Kentucky, Something strange caught their eye. My brother and I were coming in from the field when we saw something running across the hayfield heading toward the creek, but it stopped and rolled around in the grass for about 15 minutes, like it was trying to scratch its back. The creature, they claimed, was seven feet tall and covered with brown hair, stood on two legs, and walked like a human. The same monster, or one like it, made another appearance in southern Bath County near the Montgomery border on Halloween night of the very next year. At about 2 a.m. on Halloween, the witness to the event 
who also requested to remain anonymous, was awakened by the frantic barking of her two small dogs out on the front porch. As she got out of bed and grabbed a flashlight, she could hear the dogs still going crazy, moving to the side of the house, so she threw on a robe and rushed to the back door. On exiting her house, flashlight in hand, she could see her dogs, both white-haired Jack Russell, chasing a tall, dark object, black or brown in color, toward the chicken coop near the wood. It couldn't get out that way, she said, so it ran back toward the house. Then it ran back and leapt over the fence near the chicken house. I could hear leaves crackling and branches breaking, and my dogs were going nuts. I could see nothing, as it was now in the trees. My dog started running behind the house. I ran back in the house locked the door and ran through the living room and out to the front porch. The dogs had stopped running, but they were still barking wildly. I shined the flashlight in their direction. I could see they were looking up. As I shined the light upward, I saw a dark creature with a small head and rubbery-looking face. Its face was round and flat with long, dark hair around it. The creature kept looking back and forth at me then the dog. It did not seem to know what to do. It did not seem mean or try to hurt the dog. As I shined the light on its face, it looked at me for a few seconds. It then turned and walked into the wood. She didn't feel that the thing wanted to harm either her or the dog, and she claimed that it could have leapt over the fence easily if it had wanted to, and neither her nor her pet would have been able to get away fast enough to avoid it. The next day, several family members took a tape measure out to where she had seen the beast and measured from the ground upward to a limb of the same approximate height to the animal. The distance was seven and a half feet off the ground. She also claimed that they were able to track it through the wood for a short distance, and found a pile of hedge apples that had large bites taken out from it. In December, one of the Jack Russells came home with holes in its side. She further claimed, We thought at first it had been shot, but the vet determined that it had been attacked by something as these were teeth or claw marks. Sadly, the dog died on Christmas Day. Another dog, a pointer, had gone off into the woods the same day as the terrier and had also come back in terrible condition with internal injuries, according to the vet, but luckily it survived the ordeal. The witness revealed to one longtime investigator that her family has a history of unusual experiences at that location, going back years which they attribute to the presence of Bigfoot. They've often seen large shadows moving around in the woods by their home and heard what they said sounded like someone beating on a tree with a stick. They've also discovered several large man-like footprints on or near their property and, on occasion, smelled an overpowering rancid odor coming from the woods and lingering around the house. It's absolutely awful, one family member said. It smells like a hundred skunks and will make you deathly sick. On to the next one. A man was driving northwest from Nixon in Gonzales County at around 8 to 8.30 a.m. when he saw a huge, black, hairy, bipedal creature enter the very high cattails on the right side of the road. It was seven to eight feet tall and disappeared into the cattails. There were local stories about such a creature. On to the next one. Near Dallas in Texas, a young Hispanic woman called neighbors and asked them to come to her house immediately due to some strange ongoings in her house. One of the neighbors, Jill, grabbed her camera and headed over to the house. When Jill arrived at the house, the entire family was in a state of terror and extreme agitation. Two of the young female family members were cowering in a corner of the living room, holding on to each other. The Hispanic woman sat in a chair, curled in a semi-fetal position, rocking back and forth. She then pointed to the backyard. Jill looked through the sliding glass door that led to the backyard and saw a being approximately 15 feet from the glass door. The being had glowing red eyes that seemed to be scanning the house from left to right, 
and top to bottom. Jill began snapping pictures through the sliding glass door. At the same time, the Hispanic woman heard a long, ringing sound in her ears. Eventually, the being disappeared. Other family members reported seeing similar beings hanging around near doors, windows, and the walls of the house the same day and possibly two days before. On to the next one. In Linden, in Cass County, in Texas, it was about 1 to 2 a.m. in the morning. I woke up to go to the bathroom. When I woke up, I happened to look toward the window, and I saw this huge figure standing on our front deck. There was a security light outside, so it made it more visible to see. I knew that it was not a person. My father is six foot three, and that creature was much taller and more broad-shouldered. I did not see his actual body, just the outline, mostly through the window. It was just huge, and I was too scared to walk to the window and look out. I just laid down on the pallet I had made earlier that night while I was watching movies. I have noticed strange events occurring around our property such as our ducks had ended up dead, heads had been completely torn off, and on the way to the pond in the pasture was a dead cow with most of its inside torn out. Now we did smell rotten odors, but we brushed it off as being water moccasins because they do have a terrible odor when nearby, and at the time we did not think anything of it. We also raised horses, but nothing had really disturbed them. I was about seven when this happened, so I was terribly frightened. And a few days after the event, I was out back and I looked into the field and saw something large walking on two legs. I would guess about 100 meters away. I knew it was way too large to be anything human. Ever since then, I've been scared to go out into the country at night anymore. That night, I did not hear anything. But my mom had told me she heard screams at nighttime and thought it was a panther cry. But when I went online and searched Bigfoot screams and showed her some of the clips, she said it was identical. My mother was asleep on the couch, never woke up. I was too scared to move when I saw what I saw. It was at night between 1 and 2 a.m. The next couple of days we found animals dead. The area is extremely wooded, about two miles down the road, a small creek, and at the time of season, heavily marshy and mostly flooded. Cow pasture to the left and behind the house. Closest neighbor was about a mile from us. The place is very eerie at nighttime. I heard of incidents when I got older from friends who said they say something attacked her grandfather in Avenger, Texas, on the way back from church one night riding his horse, and also incidents in Miller County, Arkansas. On to the next one. At Linney Creek, near Dayton in Liberty County, across the road from the Trinity River bottomland, a teenage boy was squirrel hunting on his grandmother's property. He had just walked into a clearing and had a single shot 12 gauge shotgun with him. He could not find any squirrels in the trees. He then caught a movement out of the corner of his right eye. He looked forward and saw a very large creature about 15 feet away. It was six foot seven to seven feet tall. It was very broad shouldered, very hairy except for the face, had coal black eyes, a wide nose, very long arms and big hands. It was like the boy had surprised it. They stared at each other for 10 seconds and when the boy cocked his shotgun, it turned to its right and disappeared quickly. On to the next one. It was an August morning outside Brackettville, Texas, or inside Kinney County. The time was roughly between 7 and 7.30 a.m. We were coming back from Ladro on Highway 131. Up ahead, we both noticed a large, hairy creature moving across the road. This was about 300 yards away from us. We both said that must be a bear, and when we got to that spot, we should stop. Well, we got to the spot, and nothing, just
just a patch of hair in the barbed wire fence. Now, with that in mind, the fence stood about four and a half feet high. Bears have not been known to climb barbed wire fences, nor have they been seen in that part of the country for a long time. We both got back in the truck and proceeded back to Bracketville. When I got home, I called my father, who was a Border Patrol Service supervisor, and told him the story. He told me that there had been several sightings in the area from local ranchers of seeing the type of creature. He told me not to worry. It was probably just a bear from the mountains. Mountains, I thought to myself. Mountains are at least 100 to 250 miles away from here. I just couldn't understand that. I saw some clues that I didn't see before. There is a cave in the area called Kickapoo Caverns. Now, it isn't open to the public, and in the area alone, there is tons of dome mountains or really big hills and plateaus. I think maybe it was a Bigfoot we saw on that morning. The area of Kinney County is big and unspoiled. I would not be surprised if there are more sightings in this area. The problem is, you talk about this out there and people will think you are nuts. But there still are a few people that will speak out if they have the chance to do so. On to the next one. I was born and grew up on a farm in Delta County. While working in the field, we would see what we refer to as the nude woman. It was a large animal walking upright along the edge of the woods and never coming completely out into the open. I left to serve my country for 23 years and returned to the same area that I grew up in. Sometime afterward, after a heavy rain with flooding, my baby brother found footprints where this animal had departed the water and walked around in the mud. My mom and dad were traveling down Texas 71 in Delta County and just before crossing the South Sulphur River area, a large man-like animal walked across the road in front of them and stepped across a fence and headed north. Again, my son-in-law and myself had a couple of encounters with a large animal walking through trees in waist-deep water while we were duck hunting in what is now Cooper Lake. While checking my cattle at about 10 p.m., I encountered a rather large man-like animal, which looked to be about eight feet tall in my light, and he went one way and I the other. One never hears of this animal any longer, and the only wild animal you see now is wild boar and black panther. My pasture was cleared and just off Cooper Lake Project. On to the next one. In Aras County in Texas, I was on my way to Gatesville, traveling south on US 281, south of Stephenville, when I topped a hill and noticed something at the edge of my high beams crossing the road. It appeared to be a large man, possibly a hitchhiker, but as I got closer, it turned toward the truck, continuing to walk in the bar ditch. This thing was approximately eight feet tall and covered in long hair. It appeared to have long hippie-like hair and somewhat of a beard. From what I could see of this thing, it was very big. And all I could see was from the thigh up, and it still towered over the top of my truck. As I got closer, the one thing that really got my attention was its eyes. They appeared a yellowish green and only slightly shined. The nose wasn't like a pig's nose, but more human with flared nostrils, and the face seemed very human-like in its expression. It had a very large upper body and chest. It appeared to have no neck as the deltoid muscles kind of flowed into the head. As I passed, I checked my rear view and could see it turn into the brush. I checked my brakes and started to turn around, but then thought, what am I doing? Thinking my eyes and ears and the early hour of the morning were playing tricks on me and continued onto Gatesville. The rest of the way to Gatesville, I kept trying to figure out what I'd seen. Was it a man, a hitchhiker, transient or animal? I tried to put it out of my mind, but I could not quite let it go. I told my wife only after three or four years had passed, and I got that look, so I never told anyone else until I found Bigfoot websites online 
and found out how many other people have had similar experiences. It was 5.30 a.m., clear and mild. Hilly with sage, mesquite, brush, and scrub oak. On to the next one. In Trinity County in Texas, during the deer hunting season in November, my brother, son, and friend were just getting into our sleeping bags to get a night's rest before our deer hunting the next morning. When a strange sound came from behind my son's tent, it was unlike anything we've ever heard before in the forest. It was an animal with a deep, barrelant grunt and making a shuffling noise as it moved behind the tent. Being an experienced 50-year-old hunter and my brother with even more backwoods experience, having heard the noise, got up with deer rifle and light and went to investigate. The animal left the area very quickly, making a loud grunting sound and knocking down heavy brush as it left. We never saw a thing, but it was something we could not identify or explain. We even stayed at camp the next morning to look for sign or tracks to identify the creature. We found nothing, not even a track. Locals say there's a creature in this area, Trinity County, Texas, they call the Great Thing. Well, we never saw what color it was, but I can safely say it was something out of the ordinary. We don't drink liquor, and as a Christian, I don't lie. We will go to our grave wondering what came to our camp that night. Other witnesses were preparing for bed in tent at the hunter's campsite. It was piney wood, flat lowlands, heavy thickets in places. On to the next one. In August, my family and I took our camper up into the canyon for a week of rest and relaxation. My truck is an F650 diesel, which was slightly modified to tow the largest camper that I could get on the back of it. I also had a custom-built set of aluminum detachable stairs made, which made it easier to get into and out of the camper's rear door. Not that it means anything to anyone, but I have 165000 invested in this truck and camper setup. We were up in the sticks, enjoying our time off together, when, on the second night, my daughter awoke the whole crew with a loud, ooh, as soon as I opened my eyes, I said to her, what's wrong? She said, I'm not sure. I was sleeping and for some reason I woke up. And when I did, I swore that something was grinning at me through the window. And no sooner did I think that it was gone. I said to her, what did whatever you saw look like? She said, all that I saw was a big, wide grin, which looked like a carved pumpkin. And then it was gone. That's when I said, ooh. Now, the fire was still going outside, and my son and I grabbed the flashlight and my pistol. We stepped outside to have a look around. There was nothing that we saw, and so we threw some more logs on the fire and went back inside the camper. I told my daughter that maybe it was some type of residual dream or something, having no idea what a residual dream would be, but it sounded good at the time. The following day, while we were making lunch, cooking franks and beans on the fire, we started to hear what sounded like several owls hooting up a storm in the woods. The sounds were coming from several different directions, but then all of them had stopped shortly after we were done cooking and eating. My son commented that he didn't think owls were around during the day, and my wife followed in suit, saying that they were in fact nocturnal. Frankly, I didn't know one way or the other, but I listened to what they both had said. That afternoon, it had started to drizzle, but we went out for a walk anyway, wearing our ponchos. When we had returned to the campsite, my wife noticed that two of our chairs were missing. As we looked all around the site for the chairs, the reality was that, in fact, two of our folding chairs were gone. Now, when I used the term campsite, I am referring to the place where we had parked. We were alone and in the middle of nowhere. As far as we knew, there was nobody else around. We hadn't seen or heard anything except for the owls. Nevertheless, we were wet and tired, 
So we hung up our rain gear on some hooks, which I had installed on the back of the camper, and we went inside. Nightfall was fast approaching, and we were all deeply troubled, not knowing who or what was wandering around unseen by us and that had taken our chairs. My wife and daughter were already saying that they wanted to get out of there, but I told them that I was exhausted and that we should leave in the morning. It was about 10.30 at night. My daughter was reading in the upper bunk while the three of us were playing cards. Suddenly, something slammed into the side of the camper. It had hit the camper so hard that some of the interior trim popped off the wall. My wife screamed and my daughter started to cry. This camper had been modified, as well as the rear of my cab, so that I could step through a small hatch into the truck. I passed through the hatch and started the truck. As soon as it was running, the truck started to rock back and forth violently to the point where I thought it was going to flip over. The girls and my son were being tossed about in the camper, slamming back and forth against the walls, while my own head had already slammed into the window several times. At some point, my eyes had caught a glimpse in the West Coast mirrors of a huge creature that was leaning against the side of the truck. It had to be enormous because I could only see from its waist down as I was looking down the side of the truck. The truck was still rocking as I slammed it into gear and punched it, sending my wife and children flying into the back of the camper. The only thing I could think of was getting out of there fast. The path out was not terrible, but it wasn't good either. As I punched the truck and had moved maybe a hundred feet, two final crashing blows resounded against the back of the camper, which sounded like it was hit with the trunk of a tree. Everyone was crying and screaming as my son made his way up into the cab. I asked if everyone was okay, and besides being roughed up a bit, everyone was, in fact, all right. When we had cleared the woods, making it out onto the main road, I let out a sigh of relief. My son said to me, Dad, what was that? I told him and the girl that I believed I saw a Bigfoot in the side mirror of the truck. On the trip back, everyone had fallen asleep and I just kept driving, not caring if I ever slept again, with my only thought being that of getting everyone back home safely. Having made it back to the house in seven hours, I woke everyone up, and they all staggered into the house. I asked my wife to make some coffee while I stayed outside to do an inspection of the truck and assess whatever damage had been done to it. The roof and side panels of the camper had separated from each other, apparently where this beast had been grabbing it. On the rear of the camper, where the two final blows had landed, were two large indentations. One was on the right rear, and the other was right on the seam where the door met the frame, both being about eight inches deep. It looked as though two boulders had slammed into the rear of the camper. The camper was totaled by the insurance company. When I told the agent what had happened, he just shook his head in disbelief. On to the next one. just down from where Greenbrier Road and Ramsey Prong Road intersect in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, lies an area known as Greenbrier Cove. Inside the cove area is where the legend states that the Perry Schultz, a resident of nearby Sevier County, allegedly rediscovered a lost Cherokee silver mine. There are many weird tales surrounding the area, including mysterious disappearances, strange lights seen flickering among the trees, and the sound of voices off in the distance when one is quite sure they are alone. It was once claimed that the Cherokee said if the white man knew what we Cherokee know, he could shoe his horse with gold. Such are the riches that are in the mine. While Schultz supposedly worked silver out of the mine in the dark of night, it is said his wife would stand lookout with a shotgun, lest anyone discover the secret location. As is usual with this type of legend, anyone and everyone who knew the exact location of the lost silver mine of the Cherokee took
took the secret with them to the grave. Although there are allegedly secret markings carved onto trees in the area that point the way to the seeker of the mine. One man claims, as a boy, I remember hearing my father and elderly friend of the family talking about the mine. My father's friend, who had to have been in his 80s, claimed that he knew where the entrance to the mine was, but he was afraid to go back due to the area supposedly being cursed. He described having to crawl down in a narrow opening crawl up a steep shelf, and then crawl back down again into where the workable area of the mine opened up. He claimed that every time he tried to go in, something weird would happen at the location, such as a flashlight with a brand new battery refusing to work, and then something bad happening later. On this particular occasion, shortly after he returned home from attempting to enter the mine, his wife grew violently ill and had to be hospitalized. Mind you, this was a tough old mountain man who had been raised without such luxuries as indoor plumbing or even electricity in hardcore Appalachia. That would make Tobacco Road look like a Sunday school picnic. I respect the man enough that if he was afraid to go traipsing around in the mine, then I'm afraid to go there too. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!